The NHL season is well underway. The Montreal Canadiens have already played a game, and you should already be up to date when it comes to Montreal Canadiens stuff from the Montreal Gazette, thanks to the Hockey Inside Out newsletter. Wait, what do you mean you're not already up to date? Go to montrealgazette.com slash newsletters and subscribe to the Hockey Inside Out newsletter. You'll find all the stuff from Stu, from Pat, one of our, our guests today, sometimes contributes to the Montreal Gazette, Andrew Berkshire. You should go to the newsletter and check that out and also find other stuff from the show, which you're watching right now. So let's do this thing right now. My name is Julian McKenzie, and welcome to another edition of Hockey Inside Out, the first one of the 2021-2022 NHL season. No more preseason games, and uh, our panelists no longer in preseason mode as well. Stu Cowan from the Montreal Gazette is here. Rick Green, former Montreal Canadiens defenseman, Stanley Cup champion, and former assistant coach is here as well. Jessica Resnack won't be here for the next few weeks. Uh, she's out here having some fun over the next little while, taking a little bit of a break. So tapping in this week is Andrew Berkshire. You can read his stuff in the Montreal Gazette. He's got a brand new podcast called Game Over, which is going to be happening after every Montreal Canadiens game. I, uh, Yours truly happened to be on uh, the inaugural episode, uh, which was, uh, what, last night at this point? Because this episode should be coming out Thursday. Good to see you, buddy. Welcome to the Terror Dome. Thanks so much, man. Long time no see. <laughs> Long time no see indeed. Uh, and that goes for everyone, really, considering we do this as often as we do. Let's get right into it with uh, the Montreal Canadiens and their season opening loss to the Toronto Maple Leafs. A 2-1 loss in game one to start their year. They'll play in Buffalo Thursday and their home opener will be Saturday against the New York Rangers. I guess we could start off with some some basic takeaways here. Uh, I'll start with you, Rick. What was your biggest takeaway from that Canadian's loss to the Leafs? Well, I was quite impressed with the start that they had. I mean, they came out of the gate there and went right out of Toronto and very easily could have gone up, you know, two or three goals, but Campbell kind of stood on his head and, and held the fort. But very, very impressive uh, the way that they came out with their speed and, and took it to Toronto. And then they t- – started to fizzle out a little bit uh, by the 10 minute mark uh, when the penalty started to come in but uh, that that's a real positive that's something that I think that um, we're going to see quite often I hope uh, this year that uh, they've got some great skill and some great speed and really really fun to watch uh, those guys perform like that but on the downside obviously uh, their power play struggled when they had a chance to uh, to score and you know even things up or you know, move ahead uh, on the uh, scoreboard, but they weren't able to capitalize. And that's been something that, you know, we've talked about and concerned about uh, before. Also, I I found that they struggled a little bit in the defensive zone. Toronto was very active with their defensemen getting involved. A lot of times you could see the Toronto D getting down in the corner and cycling around and cause a little bit of confusion. So that area of their game, I think, will get sorted out. They have the personnel that I think that uh, are capable of handling a number of different situations coming at them. It's uh, early. It's only one game. But uh, I think they have a group that's going to figure it out sooner than later. They're going to be fun to watch. Yeah, Rick's right. I think that there's lots of positives to take from the beginning of that game. I thought that the power play was the biggest point of focus. Uh, it's been seasons now it feels like a decade that the canadians have struggled on the power play i think the last time they had a top 10 power play somebody was saying uh yesterday was 06 07 or something like that which sounds unbelievable but uh (laughs) it it was rough last night it wasn't just that they couldn't get it going i think that if you watch a game like that and you get a, a few power plays and you don't score it's usually like it's fine three power plays is not a lot it's not 100% 100% chance that you're going to score on a five on three, not scoring is okay. It's the way that they struggled. The The shot selection that they were uh, giving themselves, it just wasn't good. And without Shea Weber on the back end there, continuing to focus on point shots on a five on three, I just don't understand what the goal is. It seems so conservative to me that they're never going to get anything done. It, it's going to be very rare that they punish teams on the power play. And this team with the lack of overall scoring that they have, if they're not able to get special teams to a point where they're not actively hurting the team, it's going to be extremely difficult to make the playoffs. 
Yeah, you know, going into the season, all the talk was how the Canadians will be able to score goals with all these wingers they have now. And the big concern was the defense and goaltending. As you know, Rick said, there were some anxious moments in the defensive zone, but they only gave up two goals to a to the Leafs, but they only scored one. And uh, offense, you know, it's been a problem with the Canadians for a long, long time. And as you guys mentioned, the power play, the five on three, they had one shot on goal. They had a minute and 44 seconds, I think it was five on three. Never mind struggling to get a shot on goal. They struggle just getting the puck into the offensive zone, which yes. is excusable when it's a five on three. It should be a pretty easy thing to do. They made it look really difficult, and it shouldn't be. So you know, the takeaway is it's uh, it's almost like the same old Canadians. After all these changes, uh, the power play looked horrible, and they struggled to score goals. And the other thing is the faceoffs. Uh, I think they won like forty percent of the faceoffs. This team I've mentioned before, they're going to miss Philip Deneau. I think a lot more than a lot of people think. Uh, you know, all those key faceoffs. He took Suzuki struggled in the faceoffs. Jake Evans was horrible in the faceoff circle. And you know, last year he was over fifty percent. But you got to remember, last year Jake Evans was a fourth line center and was taking faceoffs against the other team's fourth line center for the most part. He's going to have different matchups now in the faceoff circle. And both him and Nick Suzuki really need to improve their faceoff game. That's one of the problems in the power play. You lose the faceoff. You're losing 30 seconds right there because the other team gets the puck and fires it down the ice. So some of the same old, same old problems uh, for the Canadians, despite all their offseason changes, uh, cropped up again in the first game of the season. For sure. But one thing that is interesting to note as well is that, and, and Rick brought this up, they did have a pretty good start. We'll get to the goal scorer for the Montreal Canadiens a little later on, but they did have themselves a pretty good start to this game. And I also thought Jake Allen wasn't half bad as well. And we'll also get to him later on in this episode. Uh, Rick, there's another there's a point you made in your initial statement that it's kind of stuck with me, and it regards to the it's re, it's in regards to the personnel on defense. You seem to be confident in the fact that they might have enough people to they might have the bodies necessary to be able to 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 go through a whole bunch of different situations. I'm just curious, what is it about the core that's there on defense? And I know they're missing Joel Edmonton right now. Uh, that makes you think that they'll be able to kind of turn things around. Well, I think people have to understand that, you know, everybody says, well, you got to practice the power play. You got to practice and practice. Well, that's fine. That can give you some basics as far as what you'd like to uh, accomplish out there. But I think the main point here is execution. And I think with the type of personnel that they have, uh, I think it's going to take a little while for them to gel and to feed off each other on their uh, special team stuff. And that's going to happen with game time uh, situations. And, you know, moving, uh, moving forward as they start to have more and more opportunities to, uh, to, to have power plays or penalty killing for that batter, they're going to get better as a group. And I would be more concerned if they didn't have the type of people that could make things happen, uh, both on the, uh, on the blue line and up front. But I, th I really believe that they have a really good skill set. And now it's just a matter of, uh, you know, making it mesh together, and that will happen with time as the uh, as they start to play more hockey games. Yep. Well, we'll have to wait and see. You have to remember, it's only game one. There's still uh, 81 more of these games left for the Montreal Canadiens this year. I want to move on to Jonathan Drouin, who scored the Canadiens' only goal uh, in their 2-1 loss against the Toronto Maple Leafs. How cool was it to see Jonathan Drouin after all that he's gone through over the last few months, and we saw the glimpses of brilliance in the preseason, for him to score uh, in the, uh, the hockey game on Wednesday night against the Toronto Maple Leafs? Andrew, I'd like to get your thoughts first. Yeah, busting that goal slump. I think it was 27 games going back to last season before Duran took his time off. And I think it's extra special that he was assisted by Josh Anderson, who was his yes. number one supporter throughout all this and had that amazing quote going into preseason where he, you just saw how great of a teammate Josh Anderson is. And I thought that was incredible. And I'm surprised it didn't spark the team a little bit more. And I know that the power plays that the Leafs got in that first period kind of took the wind out of the sails a little bit for the Montreal Canadiens. And, you know, having the game tied up on them stopped them short a little bit. But th this is kind of what worries me about this team overall is we've kind of seen this play out for a few seasons now is they start out each game really hot, really strong. And if they don't pile up a couple of goals, it just fades over time. And they kind of just it's like a war of attrition and they eventually can't keep up scoring wise. But Druin, great start. I'd like to see more from him. I want to see 
like more consistency this season. I think last season, despite the goals not being there, he actually had a really strong start to the year. It was his best defensive numbers he's ever had as a Montreal Canadian. So I, I like what I see from Drouin so far. I hope we see the same level of commitment uh, to the defensive game that we saw last year as well. Yeah, Drouin's smile on the bench after that goal was priceless. And, uh, you know, as Andrew mentioned, the fact that it was Josh Anderson setting it up made it even more special. You know, he lived with Jonathan Drouin for a month uh, before training camp. They trained together on and off the ice. So it was, it was a really special moment. But as Andrew said, too, you know, you think it would have sparked the team more. Uh, they won, I believe it was 17 minutes without a shot on goal at one point in the game. And, it's, you know, you obviously they, they need to be more, have more of an offensive presence. For Jonathan Drouin, you know, when Jonathan Drouin, when things are going good, everything's great. When things aren't going, at least in the past, when things weren't going well, you could see it in his game and in his body language. So getting that goal, as you know, ending a long goalless uh, slump, as Andrew mentioned, is going to be huge for his confidence. Uh, we'll see how he uses it moving forward. Uh, but a great opening night for him. But, <clears throat> again, you thought the Canadians would have fed off that more. And a uh, great start, you know, that set play they had right off the opening faceoff with Brett Kulak breaking down the wing and, and picking up the dump in and getting a great shot on goal. Uh, they had three great scoring chances in the first 30 seconds there. But then, you know, it just it, it stopped. And uh, again, a great moment for Jonathan Drouin, but uh, the team didn't respond to it the way you would hope they would. And for me, uh, you know, seeing Jonathan Drouin smile the way he did, uh, you know, I think a lot of people are really, really happy to see this in a guy that, you know, had uh, had some struggles. And, you know, uh, he was really involved. He's spoken about how he's looking at the game differently and how he wants to uh, progress and be more involved in each, uh, you know, each facet of the, uh, the game, both offensively and defensively. And I think that, you know, uh, every everybody had their eyes on him, and anybody everybody was anticipating. Okay, what are we going to see from Jonathan? He uh, he was engaged, he was involved, and you have to take that as a real positive. Now the real challenge will be, you know, as the year goes on, can consistently do that and bring the type of things that everybody is hoping that he will bring, that will make him a real valuable player. And I also have to talk about his uh, line mates as being huge assets to, uh, you know, complement his style of play as far as, hey, listen, you got Anderson, that's a, a quality guy, Dvorak, that's a, a real good, smart player. They've got great speed, great chemistry, and they're going to be a really fun uh, line to watch. And I think we're going to see good things from them. I'll say this, considering the situation that he's in, where, you know, he, he's, he's months removed from dealing with his personal issues and anxiety, He's on a line with a really good center and Christian Dvorak and his buddy and, and Josh Anderson. There, there are parts of this recipe coming together that could culminate. Maybe I'm talking out of turn here, but this could be what Jonathan Drouin needs in order to have his best season as a member of the Montreal Canadiens. I, I don't know how it'll stack up compared to what people might project Nick Suzuki might get. I know a lot of people have said, you know what, Cole Caulfield is going to win the Calder Trophy this year. But I, I, I have this weird feeling that Jonathan Drouin, off of what we've seen in the preseason, I know it doesn't matter for much, but for him, I think it mattered more than other players. And the situation he's being placed in with the Montreal Canadiens, you're not seeing him thrown in as a center. You're seeing him playing on a, on a line with some really good players. It could culminate in his best season as a half. And it doesn't even necessarily have to score like 20 goals for that to be the case. If he's able to contribute on plays, if he's able to make plays himself, just show some skill, I think that should be fine for him. I don't know about you guys, but my expectations for him, the bar has been lowered considering what he's been going through these last few months. And I think if anything, if he's able to get like a 50 point season, that's not bad. I don't think for Jonathan Drew, I think that's not a bad season for him considering what's going on if he's able to keep things going well. Well, as I mentioned I in the previous shows, Dominic Ducharme is going to give Jonathan Drew every opportunity to succeed. You know, that long history they have going back to their days in junior. He's put him with two line mates. He's kept them together right from the start of training camp. You got to remember Jonathan Drew scored two goals in 44 games last season. He's already halfway there after one game. And Jeez. I remember last season when he was asked about, you know, how do you explain only scoring two goals? And he had that comment, well, he looked at a column to the right, meaning his assists. And, and Jonathan Drouin's never been a big, huge goal scorer. He's more of a playmaker. But playing with these two guys he's playing with now, 
uh, it's going to give them a, an opportunity, I think, to score more goals. So getting that first one early uh, is going to be huge for his confidence doing that. And as, again, you know, that, that play that Josh Anderson, everybody talks about how strong Josh Anderson is going to the net and going with the puck. He, that's what he did on that play, but normally he drives right to the net and shoots, but he looked for joy, found him, and it was a great play. And, and I was just going to say, uh, you know, Stu, I agree with him, you know, setting uh, Drouin up to succeed with those uh, those two other line mates is uh, is a huge bonus for him. And, uh, you know, this is the type of scenario that we were hoping that we would see for Jonathan to give him every opportunity to uh, uh, to play up to his potential. And, um Yes, it's only one game, but we're going to take a lot more positive than negative from that one. Andrew, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I was just going to say that's kind of good coaching, right? In the modern NHL is you want to set up every player that you have, especially your most important players in the best positions for them to succeed. Yeah, you want them to push things and you know bring themselves up as well. But if you can't put them in a situation to succeed, then you're probably not doing a very good, very good job coaching, especially when it's a player who's signed to a long term contract, who's supposed to be a big part of your team. And Duran in that position now, it's going to be very interesting to see if he can maintain it. And I think that there's a good chance of it. I think 50 points is very reasonable for him. And he's done it before. I expect about 15 ish goals and 50 ish points this year. Jake Allen is the discussion topic for our next question here on the Hockey Inside Out show. I don't know about you guys. I thought he played pretty well considering the circumstances. Stu, thank you very much for mentioning how long the Canadians had gone without a shot on net between the first and the second period because I was trying to figure that out myself, and I'm not good at math. But yeah, the Canadians were just offensively. They they were struggling to start, and because of that, Jake Allen had to kind of ward off a lot of pucks without any offense, kind of helping him out the other way. Uh, what did you guys think of Jake Allen's performance against the Toronto Maple Leafs? And do you think the Canadians are in good hands if he ends up having to hold the fort for pretty much the next month and a bit? Well, that was the Jake Allen we saw for much of last season. I mean, that score would have been a lot more lopsided if not for Jake Allen last season. He made some really, really big saves. The concern with Jake Allen is that, you know, last season when Carey Price went down with yet another injury near the end of the year and, and – Allen played a lot of games in a row. Uh, he started to struggle. You know, he was winless in his last four games last season. He finished the season with a losing record, 11, 12, and 5. Part of that is he didn't get a lot of uh, support in some of his earlier games, similar to last night. I mean, I can't remember he had a ton of games where the Canadians only scored one goal or two goals, and they lost. Uh, so it was a similar scenario last night. But um, Jake Allen, uh, there's very few goalies in the NHL who can handle the workload that Carey Price was able to handle for so many years playing you know, 60 games or something like that. I don't think Jake Allen can do that. I, I don't, you know, I think the more they, they ride him, I think the more his game is going to fall off. And we saw that last season. And that's why at this stage of his career, Jake Allen has become a very, very good backup goalie in the NHL. But I think his days of being that number one guy that you can ride him for a, a long stretch of games are behind him. So it's going to be interesting to see how Dominic Ducharme uses him, you know, with three games and four nights to start the season. In normal circumstances, Carey Price would have started against the Leafs. You would think Jake Allen would start the second game against Buffalo. Uh, but it's going to be interesting to see how Dominic Ducharme uses his goalies. And I asked him about that a couple of days ago after practice, and he said, no, we're going to need both goalies to play. And we're going to need both goalies. Just you don't need them to steal games. You just need them to be the best goalies that they themselves can be. And Jake Allen was that against the Maple Leafs in game one. But, you know, you go to a backup goalie and, and – you know, they, they don't have trust in Caden Primo, obviously, to put him into that spot. And then they can claim a goalie off of waivers who hasn't played in two years in the NHL and Montembeau. And, and he's going to play one of these games. And it's going to be one of those they're going to throw him in and sort of watch with one eye and hope that he can get the job done. And that reminds me of the scenario back before the Canes got Jake Allen and the Canes backup goalie. Every time they put him in net, it was, oh, my God, like let's, you know, uh, goalie coach is watching with one eye open and, and seeing what happens. So we're going to see Samuel at some point, and uh, th it's going to be on the pressure is going to be on him to earn the Canadians' coaching coaches' confidence that they can play him and give Jake Allen a rest once in a while because he's going to need it. I, I've always been a big fan of uh, Jake Allen, and I don't see why you know anything would change from you know, the kind of job that he did last year. And I think that we, a number of times, spoke about how well he did play versus how poorly he played. And I think he's a he's a capable uh, goalie that is going to meet a challenge. And I just hope that he stays uh, healthy because, uh, 
you know, that's an area of, of concern with their depth back there with Kerry Pricing. But, you know, looking at last night's performance, I thought he made some really good timely saves, controlled a lot of the rebounds and was in great uh, position and, you know, got the job done and gave the team a, a chance to win. And, you know, this is uh, obviously uh, going to be uh, needed much more often and consistent with uh, Jake Allen, who's going to probably carry a, a, a large portion of the uh, games. But I, I'm, I'm confident to feel that he's a, he's, a, he's a good goalie. He's going to be able to do the job, and let's just hope he stays healthy. Yeah, I think that uh, Stu nailed it on the head in terms of uh, the consistency with Jake Allen when he's asked to play too many games in a row. I think that's where he starts to fall apart. It was the same in St. Louis whenever he was asked to be the de facto starter. Things started to fall apart a little bit for him. But when he's able to spot in now and then, he can give consistently excellent performances. And I think last night was a great start. Uh, I know Evolving Hockey had the Leafs down for 3.8 expected goals based on the shots that they had. So that means in one game, he's saving almost twice as many goals as uh, what the Leafs are putting up in, ter like, uh, in terms of the quality of their shots, which is great. It's a great start. I think that the Canadians definitely have to be careful in not riding him too hard. It's good that they're going to Montembeau for the game against Buffalo on uh, Thursday night. Putting Jake Allen in too much too early, I think, is would be a huge mistake. So I think they're cognizant of what they have to do here. It's going to be questionable whether the backup can keep them confident enough to not ride Jack out Jake Allen, right? Because that's kind of been the issue with Carey Price as well over past seasons before they had Jake Allen is they were never confident in their backups. So Price was playing on like 65, 70 game paces and getting injured and falling apart when he could have been playing 55 to 60 game paces and maybe putting up better numbers. Yeah, and, and we don't know when or even if Carey Price is coming back this season. I mean, Mark Bergeron said he's confident he's going to come back this year. He's gone for a minimum of 30 days in the player assistance program. But you got to remember, he's also coming off knee surgery, which the recovery from that wasn't going well. He's had no training camp. Uh, so it's not like after 30 days, they're just going to drop him in the lineup and he's going to be ready to play. And that's if after 30 days he's, he feels he's ready to come back. I mean, nobody really knows exactly what he's going through. But, you know, his buddy Shea Weber is back home now in Kelowna, B.C., uh, enjoying family time and, and not thinking about hockey. And I wonder how much that might factor into Carey's decision also. Like, maybe he's had enough. Maybe he's, he's, it's time for, you know, when he sees what Shea Weber is doing now, maybe he thinks it's time. And, again, I'm just speculating it's time to – have family time and go back to his place in Kelowna and he's got more money than I'm sure he can ever spend. And so the, uh, you wonder, like, I don't think it's guaranteed that Carey Price is coming back this season. And when he does, like, who knows when he does? Nobody knows. I don't think Carey Price knows when or if he's going to come back at this point. You wish him all the best and whatever he's going through and then he can get himself and his, his life and everything back together. And, and But once he does that, is he going to want to come back? into the pressure cooker of being the goalie for the Montreal Canadiens. I mean, only he knows the answer to that, but um, you know, I think, you know, I think when Mark Bergeron said he's confident that Carey Price will return this season, I'm not as confident. And if he does come back, uh, I don't think it's going to be until a large chunk of the season is gone. And that means that they're going to be relying heavily on Jake Allen. I do I, wonder I if the, like, how do the Olympics play in for Carey Price, right? Because we know that he wants to compete at the highest level, that he's a competitor, right? I think that Shea Weber, the same situation, right? If he could play physically, he'd be out there on the ice. And I think Price is probably the same way, but I know Stu has a point. Like, once things settle down, maybe you like being away from the game a little bit and relaxing. But I, I assume that Price wants to play for Team Canada, and he has a spot there, I think because there's not a lot of great Canadian goalies at the moment. So I, I think that he get, will come back this year. I hope he doesn't rush it. That's the only thing. You wonder. Rick, I want you. Oh, sorry. You wonder, yeah, Rick, I wanted, I wanted to get Rick to get in this point because he's trying to get a point in, and then we'll go back well, to Stu. No, I was just going to say that I think it's important that we don't speculate on when or if Carey Price comes back. I think it's really important. I don't think it should be used. It could be a possible distraction. Listen. You've got, you've got two goalies that are there now with the team ready to play. You've got to concentrate on getting them the best they can uh, play, the best they can uh, play. And, you know, if Kerry comes back, uh, obviously huge bonus. But right now they've got, they've got two goalies. They've got a lot of uh, work ahead of them. And, you know, let's let these guys uh, 
carry the ball and see if they can uh, do the job. Jake Allen, I'm like I said, I'm confident with. Montembeau is another story yet to be proven. But uh, these are the guys that you got to run with at this time, and these are the guys you got to focus on. Well, as Andrew mentioned, the Olympics are the Canadians going to want or let Carey Price go to the Olympics if he That's wants a to good go? Good point. Now, with that knee injury, are they going to want him to take that two week break and just let now work on the if he is back before the Olympics? Are they going to want to send him to the Olympics? And with you know all the injuries that he's been dealing with, I mean the, the knee surgery, he had a hip issue last year that didn't recover. Issue. The, are they going to want him to go and play in the Olympics, or are they going to suggest that he stays here and continues to work and make sure that he's he's healthy and ready to go for the final stretch? If indeed he is back in time or before the Olympics start. Yeah, I'll say this. I, I think considering what the Canadians have had over the last few years in terms of backup goalies, and you guys can fill in some blanks to help me out here. Peter Budai, Alex Ald, uh, Dustin Tokarski, Antiniemi. Uh, Antiniemi. Mm-hmm. Jake Allen is as good as it's ever gotten in terms of backup goaltenders for the Montreal Canadiens. We have to remember as well, while Jake Allen starts near the end of last season, we're kind of faltering a little bit. You have to remember, uh, the condensed schedule did not help the Montreal Canadiens. They were going through games almost every other day. They weren't practicing nearly as much. I think that also contributed to not just Jake Allen, but I think the team finishing the season on not so great a note as they would have liked. So I I think in this particular situation, Jake Allen uh, in a much more normal 82 game schedule might look a little bit better. I think Sam Altenbo obviously might be the huge key in terms of how he plays. It would not surprise me if uh, by the time you all get this episode, Sam Altenbo is announced as the starter for uh, the Canadians game against the Buffalo Sabres and that Jake Allen starts on Saturday against the New York Rangers. I'd be stunned if they let Jake Allen do back-to-back nights, which would mean a game in Buffalo on Thursday night, and then uh, Jake Allen ends up sitting on Saturday, or he plays on Saturday, which would mean it would be three consecutive starts for him uh, in favor, uh, not the expense of Sam Montembeau. I'd ex- I would expect he would get a start in at some point. Uh, the final I, I point... Would... Okay, go ahead, Sue. Sorry, usually I, I would definitely start Montembeau in Buffalo. Because I think you want to get it over, I don't know if that's the right word, sooner rather than later. Let him get a start rather than sitting there for five, six games before you let him play. Start him right away. See what he can do. And don't start him his first game at the Bell Center. You know, if he lets in a couple of bad goals at the Bell Center, we've seen what, you know, fans can do. We saw one of the preseason games when one of the, I can't remember the goalie's name now, when he let in a bad Kevin goal. Kevin Boulay. And then there were mock cheering him every save he made after that. So for me, I don't. You know, after the first two games, they play four straight games at home. To me, start them, get them in sooner rather than later and do it on the road so that if he does have a rough night, he won't be hearing it from the fans at the Bell Center. For our final question on this week's episode of Hockey Inside Out, I want to talk about a man who is uh, going to be a little bit richer starting next year, and that's Nick Suzuki. He signs an eight-year, $63 million extension. Uh, Mark Bergevin doing the deal in his final year as and well the final year of his contract as general manager of the Montreal Canadiens. Do you think Mark Bergevin made a good decision in locking up Nick Suzuki for uh, the next eight years? Rick, I'd like to start with you. Well, I mean, I always used to look at Nick and, you know, he always had a smile on his face. He's got a really big smile on his face right now with that nice contract, well-deserved contract. And I think as an organization, Bergevin is, is making a statement saying, listen, you are our future. You're the type of guy that one, that we need to represent us on and off the ice. And we've got nothing but great hopes for you moving forward. And to lock him up until he's 30 years old at that price point, I think is a great deal. Security. And like I said, it's a statement made by the organization. These are the kind of guys that we want to have long term. And, uh, you know, Nick uh, is going to be a real good player for this organization for a long time. So I think it's a, an excellent deal for the uh, the team and a, a real good kid and serving of everything that he can do. And it's going to be fun to watch him, uh, uh, you know, perform the way he performs because he's a, he's a good player. Yeah, I absolutely love this move from Mark Bergevin. I've been saying that they should do this from the moment the puck dropped in the playoffs last season, even into last season. Uh, if you believe in a young player, and you have confidence in their future, and they want to be in your organization, extend them for the longest time that you possibly can at a number that's lower than what they're going to get in a couple of years. 
We've seen this mistake that the Canadians have made in years past with bridge deals where they were acting uncertain about players who were sure things already. And it, it burns you when that next contract comes. Getting it done with Suzuki now probably saves them two to three million against the cap five years from now, six years from now. You get him throughout his entire prime. This is the perfect move for the Montreal Canadiens. I think Nick Suzuki is the key forward going forward for this franchise. And like two years in a row in the playoffs, he was absolute money. He doesn't shy away in, in the most important times of the year. I love this kid, and I think this is a great move. Any eight-year contract with that much money is a risk, no doubt about it. But yes. if I'm going to take a risk, I'm going to take a risk on uh, Nick Suzuki. I, he's It's been really cool watching him uh, when he first arrived here as that sort of shy, nervous kid when he was being interviewed and sort of like a deer in the headlights to the confident young man he's become both on and off the ice. Uh, I mean, there's a reason why they're putting an A on his sweater for some games this season as an alternate captain. He's mature way beyond his 22 years, both on and off the ice. And, and you know, the, the news conference he did after he signed the contract, and uh, I asked him, you know, it's like, you're a young guy. How do you deal with that much money? And he said it was sort of like he was playing the NHL 20 video game. He can give himself whatever contract he wanted. And it sort of it's a, was a great answer from a young kid because I'm sure he's played those video games and, you know, where you make your contracts and you do whatever. But uh i'm not you know you worry if some kids that kind of money might screw them up or mess them up, up i don't i don't worry about that with nick suzuki he's he reminds me a little bit of saku koivu in both on and off oh. the ice and just he's that calm on uh, on the ice off the ice but he's a competitor and dominic ducharme said that this week said one of the things he likes the most about suzuki is his competitiveness and they're trying to get him to use more of that because he's such a, a, a his hockey IQ is so high that he sometimes tries to think the game too much instead of just being competitive. So they're going to work on him with that. But as again, if I'm going to bank on someone and, and as Andrew mentioned also, I'd rather take the risk on a 22 year old guy. I wrote a column about this this week rather than paying some older guy for what he's done in the past. Uh, the San Jose Sharks are a great example about that. They've done that with a lot of guys. Eric Carlson's making $11 million a year. I believe he's the highest paid defenseman in the NHL. His best years are way behind him. So the Canadians are banking that Nick Suzuki's best years are ahead of him. And he's given no reason up to now to believe that he won't continue to improve. As I mentioned earlier, he's got to work on his face-offs. But Sidney Crosby wasn't very good at face-offs when he first came into the NHL either. And Suzuki's work ethic is there. He'll work at it with more uh, repetitions and more games and more experience. I think he'll get better in the face-off circle. He's strong. He's stronger than people think. He's like the modern-day hockey player. His weight, is, his strength is down on his legs and his butt. And, and so I, he'll, I, I think he'll get better in face And, again, I think it's a great move. You lock him up. Uh, he wants to be here also. He wants to be in Montreal. He's the future of this team. And, he, as I said, he reminds me of a young Saku Koivu. And it'll be interesting to see as he moves forward if he can develop into – what Saku Koivu was for this team. And that's what the Canadians are banking on and hoping on with this contract. Yeah, that's high praise to, to put Saku Koivu in the same conversation as Nick Suzuki, obviously with the context that you brought up. But we all know how much Saku Koivu means to a city like Montreal and this organization like the Montreal Canadiens. Uh, gentlemen, this has been absolutely fascinating and amazing to sit through and ask questions over. This was an amazing time. And Andrew, you fit into the crew like a glove. Congratulations on your maiden voyage on the Hockey Inside Out show. How, how, how are you feeling after all that? Great. It was great to meet. Uh, I see Stu again and great to meet Rick. Great to meet a Stanley Cup champion. And nice to see you again, Julian. Oh, of course. Always a pleasure to see you and always a pleasure to see Rick and Stu and the rest of our uh, family of panelists on the Hockey Inside Out show. That's going to do it for this week's edition. Subscribe to our YouTube channel because we always love it whenever you do. Subscribe to the Hockey Inside Out newsletter at MontrealGazette.com slash newsletters and visit HockeyInsideOut.com to check out full episodes, read some articles, look at the live blogs from Eric Leon and some other great stuff that we have on the website as well. Bye for now.